Welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicast. In this two-part series of the Hangar Z Podcast, Jack Shanley and I sit down with Lieutenant Steve Ferris from the Seminole County Sheriff's Aviation Section. Lieutenant Ferris shares his unique journey, tracing his early interest in law enforcement and aviation, alongside his family history that shaped his career path. Lieutenant Ferris discusses his progression from patrol officer to helicopter pilot, and eventually earning the title of chief pilot, as he highlights critical moments that influence his ambition and guided his leadership strategies within the aviation section. We examine the growth of Seminole County and the unique challenges of living in an area with a significant alligator population. Lieutenant Ferris discusses the structure of the aviation unit and the integration of drones into their operations. He also shares invaluable insights on the challenges and successes of the aviation program, emphasizing the importance of effective communication, fostering a strong culture, and the need for strategic succession planning within the aviation unit. We also get an opportunity to discuss aircraft replacement cycles and the financial justifications behind them. We also discuss considerations necessary for operating in diverse weather conditions. With a strong emphasis on leadership principles, Lieutenant Ferris articulates how common sense plays a role in enhancing operational efficiency and safety. Thank you to our sponsors, Becker Avionics, Summit Aviation, and Precision Aviation Group. Welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts. The Hangar Z Podcast is the first and only podcast dedicated to promoting and exploring the personnel and equipment behind the missions in public safety aviation. Join your host, John Gray, Jeff Ratkovich, and Jack Shanley. So southbound, skidding to a stop down by here. Looks like they're getting ready to bail. Heads up, guys, bailing. Okay, the guy, he's running through the house, jumping the fence, through the shotgun, threw something out. Grabbing the shotgun. Don't go over that fence. Don't go over that fence. Grab the shotgun again. He is armed. Stay there. Hold your position. Four on the stop. Good advising, Coach. Four on the stop. Hey, welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast. I'm your host, John Gray. I have an awesome uh, conversation in store for today. Conversation that we've been trying to get uh, lined up and, and kicked off for quite a while. Had the, the honor and privilege of meeting Lieutenant Steve Ferris. Um, we were at Orlando last year at AppsCon, and uh, you've known Mike Reno for quite a while, and, and he spoke very highly of you. And we uh, ran into you at Blue Drop of all places. They were doing some some simulation uh, simulator testing there and and demos, and uh, got a chance to meet you and, and some of the folks that that work for you. It's it's an honor to have you on the podcast. So thank you for joining us, sir. Well, thank you, John. It's an honor to be here. Been looking forward yeah. to this. Yeah, and to uh, to kick the conversation off. We got Mr. Jack Shanley. How you doing, sir? Doing very well. Everything's good. Good. I appreciate you uh, joining us. Uh, we just spent a uh, better part of two weeks on a on a road tour. Uh, we went all over the the southeast portion of the country and and uh, finished our trip in Washington D.C., which was a lot of fun. Did a, a, a epic flight with just about every agency we were with, and uh, it culminated in a flight with D.C. Park Police. And uh, that was that was awesome. You feeling recovered from that? I'm still tired. <laughs> we were busy. I, mean, yeah. I was a, I was gone for two weeks for that, and but our week uh, on the road, that was, that was that was a busy time. We were we weren't goofing off. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, we had a lot of got a lot of great content that's gonna that's gonna appear here in the near future, and had some great conversations and some great flights. Everybody treated us great. Uh, so we will, we'll have to do that again. And then and we actually chatted about that and Fl- Florida was brought up, uh, Steve, the, uh, doing a, a tour through Florida. So who knows? You may Come see on us down. in the future on a tour. Come on down. We'll throw a couple seats in for you. Yeah. That'd be Sounds awesome. Good. I'd gone down to visit my dad in South Carolina prior to a trip. So roughly for two weeks, I ate barbecue and everything, everything Southern style. So <laughs> I, I think I gained about 15 pounds in two weeks <laughs> everywhere we went, including Bucky's, you know, I went, went to Bucky's for the first time ever. And that was absolutely amazing. I was so enamored by Bucky's that I took my sunglasses off and left them in Bucky's. So some, <laughs> some patron of Bucky's got a brand new pair of blend, uh, blenders sunglasses, courtesy of the Hangar Z podcast. Um, but anyways, uh, happy to have you on the, on the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Uh, before we get into your background and, and, and what you're doing, uh, I want to just bring in two of our traditions that we do. And, and one of them is drink the day. It's, it's early for, for all of us. 
Jack's got a very special drink of the day, which I don't know if I'm into or not. But uh, for for me, uh, it's again being early. It's uh, Black Rifle Coffee in my Hangar Z podcast Yeti, and uh, nice. we we're talking offline, and uh, I saw Steve. You've got a a pretty cool Yeti yourself. What, yeah. What's your drink of the day? Oh. And and tell me about that cup. I'm over here double fisting. I've got my Yeti. <laughs> my team got me one year for my birthday and I was like, wow, I must be doing good. I got a birthday gift. What, I wonder what I'll get next year. Nothing. Uh, <laughs> I got a couple yeah, of birthday that's... comments on Facebook. That was <laughs> but I weaned off this stuff because I know it's terrible for you and I keep reading even more and more, but I had to drink like a quarter or half of it just to be entertaining for you guys. Make sure I <laughs> what? talk of <laughs> Don't get quiet on you. Get stay extroverted. <laughs> those those Yeti cups, man, they make a great gift. Um, mm-hmm. It's a it's cool swag for your unit to promote your unit for the ones that, can, that you know afford to to buy those and and sell those through their unit fund. Um, Yeti just makes some great products. So that's another company we're not sponsored by. And if if they want to yeah. pop on and join us, <laughs> more than welcome. Hope to. I can help you get sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> the Jack. What's uh what's drink of the day for you today? There's there's no drink of the day. I have to uh, have nothing for four hours prior prior to a procedure that that we all know and love. And uh, so right. I drank a gallon of something else in the past twenty four <laughs> hours. <laughs> uh, so there's no drink of the day. Okay. Why didn't you man up and get the uh, the pay for the smaller version? That's what I did. They're like, this is a more expensive, but it'll be more of a pleasant experience. Really. Oh, they'll yeah, be told me a, about that. There's like a, <laughs> it's a smaller quantity oh. and it's it's uh yeah, you don't have to drink the whole gallon. Oh my gosh. Okay, so still I'm not gonna pleasant. talk to the doctor today. Still not about pleasant. They didn't offer that time, to you. you know. I think it was an eighty dollar copay or something that was Oh, I'd pay pay that in a heartbeat. You can afford it. I I'd pay that in a heartbeat. That's uh <laughs> the prep is just awful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you gotta well, do the, it. It's important. That's right. Yeah. It is important. Yep. And I know that, and uh, so it is what it is. I'll, <laughs> I'll deal with it. <laughs> the The next part is the hot seat, and uh, again, just in the interest of time, we're going to do one question. And I selected this question, not realizing that uh, there was a fast uh, fasting period that, that Jack had to go through. <laughs> this might be <laughs> this might be a little a little torturous for Jack. Uh huh. So anytime you're fasting, or at least anytime that I've fasted in the past, it seems like you see more ads and commercials for things that look and taste good than you ever saw them in your life before. <laughs> so this this might be a, a, a kind of a part of that. Um, but Steve, for you, uh, you guys don't have In-N-Out in, in Florida as far as I know, right? We don't. So In-N-Out um, is my favorite burger joint. There's always a, a competition people talk about, and there's pretty spirited conversations about Five Guys versus In and Out versus you know White Castle or the other places that people like, uh, but I like In and Out because you can customize your stuff however you want. So mm-hmm. you can order your fries extra well done, well done, uh, extra salt, no salt, however you want. But I feel like uh, this question, there, there's it's very divisive. Uh, so the question is, would you rather eat fries fries with no salt or have to eat over salted fries? Ooh. Is that for me? Yep. I would say uh, no salt. Okay. Man, I, I feel like those are both torturous things. The no salt, it, I mean, it's just a wet noodle almost. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but the over salt, you can't like, you can't taste anything but salt and it's almost repulsive. So I don't know which yeah. one of those two is better. Um, again, tar- sorry to, to plague you with this, Jack, but what would your answer that be a food question john a food (laughs) question last it's been let's see saturday night at 1800 hours since i had solid food so anyway john i would say (laughs) even better even better (laughs) no salt no salt absolutely i'm not a salt guy okay do you get it with no salt just in general i i don't i just order them up the way they are and i don't mind that but if i had to choose between a lot of salt or no salt i'll take no salt all day okay all right well, that answers that. That was pretty painless. Was, thanks was a lot. Be- painless. Yeah, thanks. whatever. <laughs> thanks for going easy on me for my first time. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of a lot of uh, 
jokes pointed at, at Jack today. Oh yeah, to, that's, okay. Yeah. that's okay. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, again, thank you for joining us. Um, you guys have a, an awesome program, uh, Seminole County. Can you, before we get, get into the conversation, can you just tell our listeners where Seminole County is and and kind of a little bit about Seminole County? Sure. We're in central Florida. We're just north of downtown Orlando. And um, we're about 345 square miles with a over 400,000 population. We're the 13th most populated county in the state. We're about 10% water, but mostly, you know, densely populated neighborhoods and and some rural areas as well. Hiking, hiking trails, rivers, lots of alligators. We have the most populated. We have just south of the airport here, Lake Jessup. Last I heard, it used to be 15,000, but they started allowing harvesting. So I think we're down to 10,000 alligators in that lake. Jeez. Holy cow. No, so, no thanks. <laughs> some of my pilots will only fly over the bridge going across the lake. They won't go through the middle of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for You're obvious reasons. Yeah, we, we have a friend of the podcast. Alligators. We have a friend that does not like alligators. Brian <laughs> Smith does not Brian like Smith. alligators. He used to fly over that lake. He knows all about it. He does. <laughs> I think I've even talked about that lake with him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think most of us have a survival kit that's that's in the aircraft in case of a you know unplanned landing. And I, so what does a survival kit look like for you guys having 10,000 alligators in your area? Right. A big crocodile <laughs> Dundee knife. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have that. <laughs> we always carry, they carry a live car. chicken. <laughs> yes. Carry a live chicken in the helicopter. So if you, if you end up in the water, you throw the live chicken out to the alligator. That's my, that would be my plan. Uh, it's a great plan. <laughs> they're more afraid of us than we are of them, unless someone's been feeding them. If they get fed, uh, they get very friendly. And that was my yeah. theory. That's, that's when they get dangerous. But yeah, uh, usually yeah. they're they run away. They go underwater. They don't want to be anywhere near you. When uh, Apscon was in New Orleans, uh, my wife and I went down and did a gator tour down in the bayou, and the bayou is really cool. But you know that was the first time I'd ever seen an alligator up 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 close. And, you know, the, the tours say they don't feed them, but then you see the, the alligators start swimming directly for the boats. They're like, there's no way you're not feeding those things. Mm -hmm. But it was really cool to see them. And again, the, the bayous are beautiful. At one point, they, they pulled up a baby, a little baby, and let everybody hold it. I'm mm -hmm. like, that, that was pretty neat, you know. I don't know if that's ethical or not, but it's pretty <laughs> neat. <laughs> the, the older they get, the more, you know, brave they get as well. So you'll, there's some pretty big ones out there on Lake Jessup, but there's an Island in the middle called bird Island. And boy, you'll see some that are like prehistoric looking out there. Oh, wow. and I don't think they budge for much. They just kind of sit there and look at you. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Uh, for, for the County you're, you're part of, have you seen a lot of growth as far as the residential population in the last 15, 20 years? Yes, we are exploding with, um, develop land developing new houses the market is definitely you know we're not seeing any slowdown of building i think the mortgage rates are slowing it a little bit down but they're still building and people yeah. are still moving here to florida yeah I, I would imagine a large percentage of those new residents are from california right <laughs> yeah. yeah yep we're slowly moving out to everywhere but california right I think i'm one of the few that's left behind <laughs> what i'm hearing well, uh, why don't you start off by letting us know where you grew up and, and uh, where you went to school and how you found your way to, to law enforcement and, and aviation. Sure. So actually, I was born and raised in Central Florida. So were my parents. And I'm actually fifth generation Floridian. So my oh, great grandfather wow. and grandmother um, were in Miami but back when it was beaches and palm trees and helped get that community going. It's pretty incredible reading about that. One of my aunts did some research and sent us all some stuff it was pretty cool but um so yeah i've been in central florida my entire life i've traveled around but i do love florida i love the humidity and the beaches and the being in the water on my boat water activities i started i, I was 16 years old and just got my driver's license and my first car saved up got a somebody's old hand-me-down and 
a friend of mine told me about the police explorers, or they call them youth deputies, where you go and you get a uniform and you ride along with the deputy sheriffs. And I was like, they're like, you should come to a meeting. And I'm like, really? Okay. So I went and did a ride along and I was hooked on, you know, and that's what I did through all my teen years after that was instead of going out, I was riding night shift and uh, <laughs> it did keep you out. It kept me out of trouble. I don't know if I would have, yeah. how much trouble I would have gotten into anyway, but I yeah. definitely can see the, you know, and they were very strict. Like if you get in trouble or caught at a party, I remember going to a party once and I get there with some of my friends and there was alcohol. I immediately freaked out. I was like, what am I doing here? I could lose that, that uh, privilege like they talked about. And no sooner than I got there, just showed up, I see all the Seminole sheriff cars pull up and I'm like, oh no. So I'm like, everybody's fleeing and I'm walking out. I start seeing people I recognize and I'm like, oh my goodness. I just, we got in a car and drove off and I was like, <laughs> nope, not doing, not doing this. So those programs are good for so many reasons. And that's a big, big part of it is the accountability yeah. for kids, you know, whether it it's was. a leadership program or athletics, having somebody to be accountable to other than your parents, I think is huge. So yeah. I love those programs for a lot of reasons. And that's a, a big part of that. Um, Going back to the, the first ride along you talked about, do you remember any of the calls that you went on as part of that first ride along? Like, what was the thing that hooked you? Thank you to our sponsor, Precision Aviation Group. Mission critical operators and fleet managers rely on Precision Aviation Group as a worldwide leading rotor and fixed wing MRO provider. PAG provides tip to tail solutions in four MRO segments, avionics, components, engines, and manufacturing DER services. A single point of contact gives you access to over 150 million in inventory globally, 24 seven. Just call 800-537-2778. Precision Aviation Group. Others sell parts. We sell support. It was unbelievable, just the constant action all night long. And, you know, the, the uh, it was just so interesting. I remember Cops was big back then when I was a teenager. And it was like I was on the show. I mean, I was just riding around going, wow. You know, and I remember being interested in watching that show. But I never really thought about pursuing it as a career. But then after spending years of doing the ride-alongs, I got old enough to sign up for the police academy out of high school, went to a local. Uh, parents pulled me out of public school, and, and uh, they didn't like the system. So I was doing private school, faith-based type stuff. And then I got old enough to get in the police academy, and I did it. Graduated just in time when I turned 19, just before you had to be 19, but by the time you graduated, and uh, got on as a reserve deputy and went through field training on my, you know, no pay, free, freebie. I was about two weeks from grad, you know, graduating field training and got the call for full-time employment. Oh, wow. That's cool. At 20 years old. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Some of the deputies wrote letters for me and all and got on pretty young. So you had already done everything you needed to do for the most part when they, when they gave you the full-time call? Yeah, I was like, I've already proven myself and wow, got some great. letters of recommendations from some of the guys on the TAC team that I was riding with. We were all in action and I was just a young, I mean, I was like maybe 135 pounds, skinny, young guy. <laughs> They're like, you know, busting my chops and but I would get out there. I don't know why. And just no fear kind of doing what I needed to do. And oh, you were 19. <laughs> I was 19. 19, no fear. Yeah. No fear. <laughs> Did you have family members that were in law enforcement that kind of no. motivated you? No. I found out after I got in aviation that my great grandfather that I was very close with that died when I was 10 was an air traffic controller here at Sanford for the Navy when it was a Navy. Oh, wow. Base. I'm still okay. on my mom trying to find that picture because I saw it at some point at her house and we can't seem to find it it's somewhere but i wanted to hang it in my office he's standing in the control tower how cool he would know that his grandson you know wound up working here for almost you know 30 years or more so i had a choice i, I signed up for the state college here and was going to work on my degree while i had a job here and i did that for a semester and of course I had the credits from the police academy then i went and did a discovery flight i was always into remote control aircraft and all and i just somehow was here at the airport and did a discovery flight just for fun 
wasn't thinking about it as a career. And I, I was hooked. Same thing, yeah. you know, just he let me take off and land in the Cessna 172. And I was like, I got to do this. I got to save up. Wound up switching courses and putting a lot of funding into the, uh, at the time it was Calm Air Aviation Academy, then it was Delta Academy, and now it's Aerosem here at Sanford. And uh, in the late 90s, 96, I started there working on my private pilot. And then I suddenly found out, actually in the newspaper, I was working patrol. It's like my first year of patrol, and I saw in the paper that we were getting helicopters. And I'm like, you know, what's a helicopter? That sounds cool, right? Yeah. And uh, just out of curiosity, because I was coming here at the airport doing lessons, I found out we had a hangar. It was all, all from the newspaper, not from, I think they were trying to keep it quiet. We had, uh, we had, uh, um, you know, the surplus OH-58s and it can be controversial, right? Government getting helicopters, but we were getting helicopters and I, I, uh, was driving around the airport in my Mark patrol car and I see airport security and I'm like, hey, do you know where we're keeping our helicopters? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, over there in that hangar. So I go over, I knock on the door. I'm like, Hey, I introduced myself. I was like, I want to check out the helicopters. And they're like, Oh, they're out being refurbished in Orlando, but come on in. You know, they got to talking to me and they're like, we're going to need flight officers. And I'm like, what's a flight officer. They're like, Oh, you'll ride in the helicopter and talk on the radio and you know, do the thermal imager and spotlight. And I'm like, well, that sounds cool. They said, you should put in for it. You know, you're working on your private pilot, put in for this, you know, when, when you see the posting, it's a part-time position. I'm like, cool. So I did and got in on the ground floor. By the time they did the interviews and all, I had just finished my private pilot. And um, six months later, they're like, we're going to start training you to be a helicopter pilot. And I'm like, Wait, what? <laughs> and, uh, wow. Yeah, say that again? Yeah. <laughs> say what? It, you know, it's, it's funny. It's, they had their eye on me, and I was just showing up, doing my thing, and helping out. Love being at the airport. It's funny when people talk about the position of a TFO, and you describe it in those terms. It seems so simplistic. Oh, yeah, you just, you know, you just talk on the radio, and you use the camera, yeah. and the light every once in a while. And <laughs> mm-hmm. I think that was my thought, you know, going up to the airport was, was fairly simple. You know, having worked in the field for quite a while, I like, oh, it like mean a big deal, man. What a what a rude awakening I had to go yeah. out there. What and being the fact that you guys were a, a new program, were you then tasked with developing all the SOPs and kind of all that stuff with the helicopter program? Yeah, um, I did eventually get involved in that, but um, but I was one of many at that time. I was just one of many. I think we had like. 20 or 30 part-time flight officers. We had a lot because it wow. was day and nighttime. We only had like three pilots, the captain and and two other shift pilots. And they were just working like a day and a night shift, eight hour shifts. So okay. we weren't even 24 seven at that time. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, of course, eventually I did get, you know, I started getting more and more. I was in charge of the part-time flight officer schedule so it was, it was always fun calling hey why didn't you call me back do you want to come work yeah and uh so yeah i uh got in on the ground floor there and after five years of work in the streets got transferred out here full-time in 1999 we built a new hangar we got a huey uh1 and they justified some more pilot positions so no longer was i working patrol and coming out here and flying I was able to be out here full time, which is what I was really excited to do. Not that I wanted to leave patrol, but, um, you know, and I also gave up a lot of other responsibilities I had. I was doing, you know, the TFO part time. We just called it flight officer back then. Now this new TFO thing, but, um, I also did honor guard and I did, um, it was called NIPM National Youth Project using mini bikes. And we had Honda mini bikes to help at risk middle age, or I'm sorry, middle school kids to stay out of trouble. They'd sign a contract with their parents. You know, they were like borderline about to get in trouble. So it's like, if you did this, you get to go out and ride with Deputy Steve and learn how to ride brand new Honda mini bikes. So it was pretty cool. We had a piece of property. So I passed all that along and focused, was it? blessed to be able to focus just on aviation and my 
aviation career and just start getting a bunch of ratings. I got, um, you know, got the commercial helicopter, of course, before I even got transferred out here. Then I got, um, you know, started working on airplane stuff, get my instrument airplane, commercial airplane, multi-engine airplane, because I knew someday I wanted to not, you know, there'd be an opportunity but I needed the ratings that you can't just get them once you get the opportunity. Yeah. So I'm like, let me do this while I'm on night shift. I'll study, you know, I'll, I'll work patrol details, like sitting in the construction zones, reading my books, you know, <laughs> on my nights off collecting enough extra money to pay for, for flight school. And, um, you know, getting those ratings as I went along here at Calm Air Aviation Academy. And yeah, I got all the fixed wing stuff. Went back when I got promoted to chief pilot after three years of night shift, we had an organizational change, some re retirements, and somehow I was uh, on deck. I didn't apply for it, but they're like, we're going <laughs> to interview all of our current pilots for chief pilot. I'm like, oh, interesting. I was about, I think, 28 years old at the time. Wow. However old I was in 19 uh, or 2002. And the sheriff picked me. So wow. well, what was I, that? Uh, what was that experience like, you know, being fairly young? I'm, I'm assuming some of the pilots that you were, you know, working over had less or, ha you know, they're more experienced and maybe quite a bit older. What was that experience like? It was tough being the young man. You know, I had they had signed me. I had like parity with a sergeant. They assigned me a senior lieutenant that was also wanting to become a um, commercial helicopter pilot. He was already private helicopter and it was his dream. So we worked closely together. Um, me and Lieutenant Jerry Human, who's since retired, and you know, he I helped him. It was funny, I helped him. I went and got my CFI, they paid for it right after I got promoted to chief pilot. And then I helped him, my boss, get his rating. And then he helped me on the managerial side of things, learning the ropes of working with people and working with the administration and finance and all that type of stuff. So um, yeah, we worked together for a while and then eventually, you know, they, I wound up taking more of all that responsibility and, you know, got promoted sergeant, lieutenant, and then, you know, wound up streamlining that, that chain of command a little bit, but, um, yeah. hey, your agency, can you, when you get promoted, do you have to go back to the field or do you stay within aviation? I didn't have to. No, we, um. You know, I know a lot of places do that, and I think it's detrimental for our industry. Yep. It is. got to get past that. I was very fortunate and blessed to have a sheriff that understood that and, and let me um, stay out here and be out here. I mean, it's been 22, 23 years now as chief pilot and over 25 out here full time. Does your current leadership support that that uh, strategy as well, or do they, is that Absolutely. changed? Absolutely. That's yeah, awesome. Absolutely. And, uh, so I feel like I've been able to give the guys and the team stability. Whereas I look at, you know, other agencies across the country and you just see the constant, Oh, we're training a new Lieutenant or new, new captain. And they come yep. in for two years. And, you know, I feel, you know, and I remind the guys we're lucky. We we've been able to consistently work together. I mean, I have many pilots that have been with me, over a decade, some over two decades of working together and we've been able to keep consistent, but we also have a lot of, you know, we have 20, a couple of new TFOs that are in our twenties. We got thirties, we got forties. I just hit 50 and one of my um, senior pilots is about to retire at 65. So then I'll, I'm going to be the new, uh, the new old, old guy telling <laughs> stories like listen to my stories <laughs> come on no that's part of the deal i remember when i was in my 20s listening to stories and i'm just like when are they gonna stop and i'm like now I'm, now i get it i'm that guy i'm like especially with some caffeine i'm like let me tell you about what, how it used to be <laughs> well you brought up something that's interesting and i think it's healthy is having you know a, a pool of folks that are different ages because I think what happens a lot of times is you give an agency and mine was one of them where you kind of, you have this group of people that come in together and because most people don't leave air support, they end up working to the end of their career together. And then all of a sudden you have this huge vacancy, you know, you might have three mm -hmm. or four, five vacancies at one time. So you have all that experience and talent that leaves 
and that leaves a big void of new folks have to come in and you know creates a young air support unit where it sounds like what you guys have done is uh you know created a succession plan with people of different ages where you don't have this max mass exodus of pilots or tfos at one time was that by design or did that just kind of happen that way thank you to our sponsor becker avionics Becker Avionics, new 3D spatial audio, will mitigate possible confusion in the cockpit by repeating the last 90 seconds of incoming messages broadcast over any two channels. Check out the new AMU 6500 at www.beckerusa.com. Absolutely by design. We are working hard. I've learned trial by error, right? Like always being in a, get in a pinch and you're trying to, get somebody in, whether it's a pilot or a TFO, we have got to recruit. We have to have people lined up for those next full-time positions. And we use the part-time TFO position to screen for the next full-time TFO opening. And those, now we're in a hundred, we're, we're no longer hiring from the outside at all. We, because we've gotten ahead of it, we've got the funding to transition pilots um, and get their pilot's licenses from deputy. And we have a whole career track now. So I'm, I'm like a hundred percent when, when Bob retires, he's the last one that did it come up from within. So my whole team, including myself, I was the first one to get to do it. And I've been able to, I was counting up this morning, like how many have we, including me, I think I'm at nine of us wow. that, that I've been able to, eight other folks that I've been able to pay it for where oh. they went from a deputy on the road here to aircraft commander pilot, um, you know, flying, flying ships. And only a couple of them have left. I still have, you know, some have gone on to pursue other things or, or to, but most everybody's still here. So it's, it's pretty, you know, and then, you know, like sometimes I've hired from the outside and, and, you know, you just, it's, it's new and then they don't feel like all of a sudden they've come in and it's like, what's going on here. And, you know, I remember that from LAPD when I visited out there in my twenties, when I was out actually doing that mini bike, uh, training it was in the big, uh, San Bernardino mountains or big bear mountain. And, yep. um, yep, I where mean. I trained at that Honda, I don't know if it's still there, that Honda motorcycle training facility, but i made some time cause I was a new part-time TFO when I got, when the sheriff asked me to do that mini bike program. And I went around and visited LAPD, LA sheriff and, um, San Bernardino. And they were all so different, but it was also made, I'm asking a bunch of questions and back to your point, John, Later, I would be in charge of those things. So I feel like I brought a lot of that back yeah. to the East Coast of how the bigger agencies are doing it. Because, you know, we're just a small two aircraft. You know, we're a small operation. And what do they say? Little, big pond, little, what's the old saying? Little uh, pond, yeah. big fish. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and uh, But, you know, I, everybody I hear, it's pretty cool to go to these shows. And they're like, Steve, we hear you guys are doing it right there. You know, you're doing it and it's pretty cool to be able to have dialed this in in the last 22, 23 years and really just, you know, it's not like it's all my idea. It's like going out and just keeping plugged in with the industry and asking questions and keeping an open mind, not being like, oh, we've always done it this way. I mean, we're still every day changing things. And sometimes we're like, no, we're not changing that because we've mm -hmm. learned that this yeah. is the way it needs to be done. Sorry, great idea. You know, new person comes in, but we also encourage the new ideas and the fresh look and like, yeah, why have we always done it that way? Maybe, you know, that is a better idea. So keeping an open mind, I encourage folks. I remember when I started here, my boss at the time, great guy, not not Lieutenant Jerry Human, but our captain was like, you know, we went to a, um, ALEA, it was called back then. And with 30 people in uniform, you know, we're all, all part-time and it looked like this big, big operation, but, um, you know, he was more about wanting to keep us here inside our operation and we're doing it this way. Don't go out there and hear all these other ways of doing things. Cause then people c creates problems for the way he wanted to do things. And I get that, but that's kind of old school. Like we encourage our love for my guys to go to these events and they come back going, wow, we are so lucky because they just, they come into this, you know, this operation and they're like, oh, this is just how it is, right? They're a deputy on the road. They don't know anything about aviation. They come in here. We got new 
H-125s and knew the latest everything. We got a hangar, we got funding, we got staffing. We've got no, you know, no deficiencies. I mean, like we have communication, you know, we're always working on that right now. Yeah. We're trying a new thing with teams, you know, Microsoft and everybody. I'm like, can we, let's try this. Let's throw in the log. In the teams, use it like a diary throughout your shift of things that no one would know you did or needed to be done. Just throw it in there. So we're trying that, and it's actually working really cool, as because we've all got it on our phones now, and it's a it's a platform. We, we've tried so many different ways, but I'm seeing next level communication throughout the teams because it's always that, right? Yeah. And uh, inviting people in, like SR three, to check our rescue waste program or. Um, APSA to come in. We're we're up for our third reaccreditation. The initial one one uh, reaccreditation, and now we're going for our third. Starting our, we've been doing it for six years now, going on our six to nine year period coming up, and um, refining that. You know, staying connected, industry standards, still making changes. You know, here's areas we can improve constantly. I think that's so important. Yeah, to have a successful operation is, and everybody's communicating. You know, back in the day, I remember early on in my career where I had some struggles and people that are just being difficult. You know, on my team and you know who's this young guy and you know spending eighty percent of my time dealing with challenges with personnel issues and you know, and twenty percent of the time maybe moving forward or getting the chance to actually you know work on things and uh that we need to be working on now I was, we were talking about this the other day it's like 99.9 percent .9 of the time we're all working together communicating and moving forward as a team everybody wants to move forward hold each other accountable treat each other with respect and like 0.1 percent of the time dealing with anything that like you know yeah they 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 hold each other accountable. I'll walk in and they're like, what are you doing, man? Come on. You know? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't have to, if I have to get involved, it's like next to never. Then, then I can focus on getting us the funding and, you know, and listening to everybody and seeing what is, what's, you know, the tempo of the operation. What's everyone's concern? Is it pay? Is it staffing? Who's going to what shift? You know, and keep the morale up and, and then, you know, making sure we have the gear and, you know, that everything's pro working with the vendors, but every, everybody on my, there's 10 of us full time here, me and the DOM. And then there's four shifts, 24, seven, A, B, C, D ship. So pilot TFO and everyone here full time has an assignment that they specialize in. I found, you know, find their strengths, forget about their weaknesses, like encourage them. What are you good at? And what can you help bring to the table um, to, to make us all better? And, every, you know, people have buy-in. That's so important. Recruiting, yeah. I've learned so many times, made the mistakes of, you know, grabbing someone. Now it's it's like part of the family. When we interview folks, it's all 10 of us show up. It's kind of intimidating. I feel bad for people walk in and there's a board of 10 people, but everybody shows up on their day off. They want to talk to these folks and I ask the tough questions and say, are you ready to join our team? And, um, you know, I let them decide. Of course, yeah. I can weigh in. And, and uh, that, but that selection process is so important because you're essentially you're, you're promoting the culture you have within your unit. If you bring one bad apple in, it, it sours the whole, the whole bunch in a lot of ways. So I, I like the fact that you put so much effort into to vetting folks through that and that's you know what's allowing you to do what you need to do as a manager. You brought up communication. I think that's always one of the challenges that agencies have. Whether uh, and I work for Ontario, California, and we had uh, twelve folks, and you had ten, so very similar size operation. Uh, people are different places, different times. It's really hard to get everyone in the same place at the same time. So mm -hmm. talking, communicating was always difficult. Mm -hmm. So I like the fact that you're looking at exploring different avenues to communicate. That sounds like a really effective tool. Jack, for you at LAPD, being that you guys were, were large, what did you guys do to communicate, you know, to spread information amongst amongst the troops? It was challenging between the three watches to to learn what was going on there. Uh, you just hear it through friends, you know, oh, we had this happen last night. You go, man, I didn't know about that. 
uh, except for incidents like safety incidents. Those were documented. Those went to a safe to the safety review board, and uh, those were read, you know, read in every roll call. Hey, this happened to this crew on this date and time, and this is how they responded to the the chip light, to the uh, you know a horn going, wh- whatever it was. Um, so the, the communication was good in safety areas, but the day to day operation stuff it, it wasn't great. Um, yeah. But one thing that that's popped into my head in listening to Steve talk uh, is that the staying when you promote that really benefited your unit a lot. And obviously, we're LA was one of the units that you promote, you leave, um, and then you fight to get back. It's mm-hmm. ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous for SWAT. It's ridiculous for K9. It's ridiculous for air support, but particularly for air support because just the financials alone having to Mm -hmm. train somebody to fly you know okay uh john's promoting out he's gonna make uh, he's making sergeant by john and now you bring in a new sergeant or or a new person to replace them um economically it was dumb and all that information and experience leaves completely and you start from scratch it's ridiculous i mean we had some some really good people that uh, should have stayed when they made sergeant and some good mm-hmm. sergeants that when they made lieutenant had to leave too. And they, they some of them fought to get back, um, it, but it takes time and effort. And in the meantime, you lose all that. Mm-hmm. And you're training somebody new that knows nothing. I mean, they, they don't know uh, a cyclic from, from a collective. And now, and the person that did know all that is out on patrol someplace. You know, and the other thing is, you, we know that people stay at air support for a long time. I mean, look at Steve. <laughs> look at you, Steve. Mm-hmm. I mean, so why why would if you were a sergeant making lieutenant, why would I want to get rid of you as a, to go out to patrol, knowing that you're never going to go back to patrol? <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. that that year out patrol, what's that going to benefit air support later? Nothing. Well, it's going to benefit patrol. Not a whole lot because you're you know you're fighting to get back to air support. So I, I I really liked what I heard there, and it and everything you talked about, Steve. Uh, it seemed to pop into my head. Well, no wonder it's going well. You're keeping mm-hmm. people there. <laughs> you're not right. losing them when they promote. You're not, and you're making it a a, a great workplace where they don't want to leave. You know, mm-hmm. we had lots of people that that would have w- would have promoted if they could have stayed, and they didn't. I'm one of them. I got the talk. I can tell you, Mike Hillman came to me multiple times. When are you going to promote the sergeant? I go, are you crazy? <laughs> why would I want to leave? Why would I want to leave a pilot job to, to become a sergeant, leave, go to patrol and work, you know, doing projects as a sergeant and then fight to come back and maybe never get the opportunity to come back, depending on the timing. That's, that's what I'm talking about. It just seems really, mm-hmm. really good what you're doing there, Steve, in that area. And it, and it goes out beyond that, that initial thing. It benefits you in other ways is what I'm getting at. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that, of how it benefited you by being able to stay and how it benefited others to, to promote, but not leave. Thanks to our sponsor, Summit Aviation, a full service provider for business, government, parapublic, and military aviation, specializing in maintenance, modifications, avionics, interiors, and paint. Discover more at summit aviation.com. Absolutely. I, I think we've been so fortunate to use a lot, been able to use a lot of common sense yes. in running the aviation section here. Perfect. And allowed word. <laughs> to use common sense and, you know, do things that, and, and, you know, yeah, I mean, it's been incredible to, yeah, where other areas, they don't allow that, you know, and, yeah. and they've made an exception here. And, you know, it's always like, oh, aviation gets the exceptions, you know, and it's like, well, but it's kind of two huge careers. We're deputies, but we're also aviators. We're pilots. Yes. There's a whole other set of things that we need to, and, and I need to recruit solid people that are positive, that are part of the solution, not part of the problem, 
And you know, so and and you gotta. I've made mistakes where I've let that go on for too long, and we don't do that anymore. We're getting so much better at screening and and uh, recruiting and getting good, talented people in here, the best of the best, to yeah. strap into this, you know, multi-million dollar machine. And you got to trust each other that you know you're going to say, hey, this happened or this didn't happen, and you know now everything's recorded and the systems are just you know but still you know you got to communicate and there's a a incredible amount of accountability and trust amongst the crews and camaraderie that's so important and you know you visit other folks or you hear at the conferences all the toxic you know stuff that's going on and all the egos and the pride and i'm like i just i'm like guys we're not doing that you know and i grew up with a lot of that here back in the old days you know it's just the culture of how you operate you know and you're scared of your boss and you quickly learn out what what he likes and doesn't like and you don't do it and you keep your mouth shut and then you go places and all these things i heard when i was a young man and i'm like i'm not doing that here i just i did it to survive but now i'm like we're going to do things differently and i it's funny to see these you know as i went to leadership things as i you know my first 10 years of being a a leader here and hearing this stuff like, Oh, you know, you don't have to make all the decisions where everybody's looking at you. You can, you can collaborate and work together and, um, you know, tap into everyone's ideas. And I, it's okay for me to go, you know what, that's a good idea. I, yeah. I think of that. Let's, that's what we're doing when I already had my mind made up, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that's so important where the, yeah. you know, we do our monthly meetings and everybody's talking, not just me. Right. You know, yeah, I might get on a little tangent, but then I shut up and let people talk and we go around the room and everybody contributes something. And uh, and then they talk it out like it's like I'm not even there. I don't think it would be any different if I was there or not. And um, maybe a little bit, but, you know, <laughs> that's fine. Well, you've, that's you've, fine. Created, you've created a good culture mm-hmm. where you can do that, where your people know they can do that. And I, boy, I... I'm excited to hear about that because that that's going to go out uh, not only in everyday operations, but safety. There, mm-hmm. There's no doubt that that affects a positive safety culture as well. If, if everybody's free to talk and, and speak up and say, Hey, I know I'm the, the youngster here, but we've been doing this and I'm a little concerned about it. Boy, oh boy. Most people just keep their mouth shut. Whereas in the culture you're describing, Steve, th- they're going to say it. And uh, Very well. and that's going to benefit everybody. So so valuable in uh, aviation. So valuable. Right. And people feel comfortable to come to me. It's not tattletaling. It's yeah. not ratting someone out. And I don't even need to know names. It's like, hey, you might want to address this, or this is right. some buzz I'm hearing, you know. And then it gives me the opportunity to address something without, you know, necessarily having to call somebody out or. You know, everybody, we all still, even though we try not to have our pride and our egos, it's going to be there. We're human. Sure. Right? Yeah. But it's it's something we need to check at the door. You know, we go out, we do a hoist mission or a Bambi bucket mission. We come back, we hot wash it. We talk about everything. Sometimes it's like, oh, you know, we really don't need to bring that up. No, we are. Let's bring it up. Yep. Say, hey, we learned something from this. And we move on and we forget about it. And, uh, or what? Forget about it. But you know what I mean. It's yeah. not like uh, yeah. You're not going to dwell on on um yeah something that was a mistake or or maybe a judgment call or something like that. You talk about mm-hmm. it. You air it out. You learn from it and you move on. You don't forget about it, but you move forward uh, with that in the back of your head that hey, next time I'm going to fix that. I'm going to fix what they talked about. That was a good good critique. And that's 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 good stuff, Steve. We have a big group. I mean, with all the part-timers, like I said, 10 full-time folks, but then we have a a group of part-time TFOs from not only the county, a handful from the county, each city. We have two of our busiest cities actually give us two TFOs. Oh, nice. We have seven cities in our county. And then we have have a group of uh, rescue swimmer paramedics that, um, and then we have um, SWAT, fast rip, snipe. We only work with the snipers. We've tried it with the whole team, but we found that keeping it dialed in with the snipers yep. and we can deploy them for active shooter. So there's a group of almost 30 folks that, you know, need to be trained and kept in the loop and people coming and going. So yeah, we have 
SMS. We have a reporting system where it's mostly the full-time folks are like, hey, I saw this. We're going to write it up. You can do it anonymously, but usually everybody just puts their name on it. Yeah. Here's something we saw. Sometimes I'm like, hey, make sure you write that up. And uh, so that everybody can learn from it, you know, whether it's, oh, I was backing in and the tail guard, you know, walked and went to the bathroom, but I kind of wanted to back it in and I almost hit the blade, you know, and I'm like, need to make sure we do, you know, silly stuff. It's nothing new, right? It's nope. the same old things that we're doing. That's right. And, um, but it keeps that, you know, and I tell them we need to document this stuff. It, it's, it's not like we're trying not to have these forms. We want as many as we can every month. And we talk about them at our, we call it our full-time safety board. And it's basically everybody that's here full-time is on the safety board. Me, the, the uh, director of maintenance, and all eight shift uh, crew members. And we only have two now that aren't pilots. And they're going to start working. So pretty soon it's going to be all pilots. Wow. And now it's like, well, how do we get the flight time? You know, we developed our our um, pay scale based on flight time. So we're looking at that because then it's like, well, I'm not going to get to my flight time. You know, so we're always evolving and looking and making, you know, making sure we're moving forward with things and relooking at things. I think it's so important and you know, not being just like, oh, we're going to do this always this way because that's how we've always done it. I think that's what helps us succeed. Yeah, I'd like to, to talk about that for a little bit about your, your pay structure because I think a lot of agencies are looking for alternatives to the, the promotional processes because a lot of people looking to promote or looking for the financial incentive that goes along with the promotion but if, as an as a unit, you guys have solved that problem internally with uh, encouraging folks to to meet a certain threshold for a next pay bump or a next uh, mm-hmm. title change, what does that look like for you guys? So all my pilots now that were CFOs are topped out deputies, and so the only raise they get is if they raise the, the uh, top out. So I had to look at last year. I I. Um, negotiated if you will or presented you know like go look here's the salary surveys this is what people are making in our industry if we can't you know let them promote to sergeant as pilots i was you know i'm, I'm like fine you know, let's have all the pilots the primary senior pilot if they test promote them to sergeant then that's a different pay scale and they're like well we can't really do that at this time so you know i said well then we need to look at raising the pilot pay because we have pilot one, two, and three based on ratings, sign-offs, you know, and um, flight time currently. You know, we're looking at that. We've changed, tweaked it a few times because it's like, this isn't fair. This person's going to have to do this for this amount of time and what's more realistic. So we, we can tweak it and we've gotten support of doing that. But, um, so I looked at that. I said, this is how much pilot one, two, and three is. We need to raise, we haven't raised it at all. We've been doing this five, six years. You know, we were trying to get it raised five or 10%, like the deputy pay was getting raised each year. So we finally got, we got that raised. We presented, here's the current salary surveys. And I said, I recommend at least this to be with the industry. And and they did. So everybody got, I mean, you look now we're, on par with it used to be the medevac you know the air ambulance pilots were always making the most and if you look at some of the salary surveys like one of the ones i used looked at our industry and um and then you saw the air ambulance pilots there too it included the helicopter and uh not just like mbaa is mostly jets and um so i looked at it and i was like wow we're right there with the Air ambulance folks now, and um, and it gives them somewhat something to work towards to get more ratings, to get that Bambi bucket or hoist sign off once they get their, you know, their hours in to do that. And uh, so yeah, there's a step plan and there's there's um, opportunity, but it's not, you know, I wish we could get more where they they can promote from within, so that when I retire, there's a sergeant already that could be eligible for a lieutenant. Um, but you know, I did it as a deputy for many years where I, I didn't get promoted. Then I started testing. I was getting to support that they would promote me in place. They encouraged me to test. So I did. And, um, I think that helps, you know, I look back and everybody was like, well, you know, he's the deputy chief pilot. 
no one ever gave me a problem that wasn't going to be a problem anyway. But it was the problem folks that were like, oh, he's just a deputy. Let me see what I can do here. Yeah. You know, and looking back, I didn't see it at the time. But even though I had parity do a sergeant, it was like, you know, it, it's it's not good. Prom- you know, and I had a one of my mentors say, you should be promoted to to the um, level of your responsibility. Right. Rank commensurate with authority or responsibility. And I was like, huh? But, you know, I see it now. I see the difference where, you know, it, it does help. You know, you have to earn respect. But where, where the rank comes into place is when you're dealing with a challenge, you know, where you have to document or write something up. And, you know, that that's no fun. None of us like to do that. But, you know, it's it's challenging to do that as a deputy. Yeah, it, it's tough because you know we're we're operating under a para, paramilitary organization that has rank structure. So to mm-hmm. to do things properly, you have to follow the, cha- the chain of command, and that's where I think uh, aviation has some problems because of what you just said. You have somebody who may not be in a sergeant's spot to promote to lieutenant when you are in a position to retire. So then you've got this void. How do you get the deputy from deputy now to lieutenant without yeah. you know without going out of order in the chain of command? So it's almost yeah. like putting a, a, a round peg in a square hole. Uh, so I've always looked for unique solutions to that, and people have come up with some pretty interesting ideas. So interesting to talk to you about that. Jack, I know you guys at LA had some some different incentives as far as flight pay goes. How did that work for, for you guys? Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Hangar Z Podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe to hear more stories that promote the personnel and equipment behind the missions in public safety aviation. Lastly, stand by for a message after a word from our sponsors. Cheers. Thank you to our sponsor, Becker Avionics. Becker Avionics, new 3D spatial audio, will mitigate possible confusion in the cockpit by repeating the last 90 seconds of incoming messages broadcast over any two channels. Check out the new AMU 6500 at www.beckerusa.com. Thanks to our sponsor, Summit Aviation a full-service provider for business, government, parapublic, and military aviation, specializing in maintenance, modifications, avionics, interiors, and paint. Discover more at summit-aviation.com. Thank you to our sponsor, Precision Aviation Group. Mission-critical operators and fleet managers rely on Precision Aviation Group as a worldwide leading rotor and fixed-wing MRO provider. PAG provides tip-to-tail solutions in four MRO segments, avionics, components, engines, and manufacturing DER services. A single point of contact gives you access to over $150 million in inventory globally, 24-7. Just call 800-537-2778. Precision Aviation Group. Others sell parts. We sell support. As we conclude this episode of the Hangar Z Podcast, we want to extend a heartfelt thank you to Lieutenant Steve Ferris for sharing his remarkable journey through law enforcement aviation. His insights into the growth of the aviation unit, the challenges of operating in unique environments, and the strategic importance of communication and culture have provided us with a deeper appreciation for the complexities of law enforcement aviation. The stories and experiences shared today highlight not only the dedication and hard work required in public safety aviation, but also the critical role of leadership and common sense in ensuring operational efficiency and safety. Lieutenant Ferris's emphasis on mentorship and succession planning serves as an important reminder of the need to foster the next generation of aviation professionals. As we reflect on topics discussed ranging from aircraft management to the integration of technology and law enforcement, we're reminded of the vital contributions made by those in the front lines. We hope you found this conversation as engaging and insightful as we did. And want to thank you for joining us today on the Hangar Z Podcast. Cheers. Time to close up the hangar. Thanks for joining us on the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts.